This morning we are starting the series called The Elephant in the Room. Everybody at one time or another has an elephant in your room. Now, I'm not talking about the person you might have came with sitting next to you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that is so obvious to everybody, but it's uncomfortable to talk about. It's uncomfortable to think about. And so you just kind of, kind of ignore it. You don't talk about it. You don't look it in the eye. You, you try to just step around it, but it's impossible because no matter how much we act as though it's not there, it's impossible to look away from and it won't go away. So we need to acknowledge it, we need to admit it, and we need to, we need to talk about it. And so that's what we're gonna be doing with this series starting today, The Elephant in the Room. We're gonna be dealing with the subject of our financial lives. And the three aspects of this particular elephant that we're gonna look at are today the area of debt, and then next week, the area of giving. And then the third week, the area of saving. And what does is, what is God's word say about, about building wealth? And so we want to talk these next three weeks about, about the biblical wisdom of, of how does God tell us to deal with this elephant in the room? Now, if you remember the last series we did on, on our speech, on our words, I said that according to the Bible, so much is written in the Bible about the things that we say or the things that we write, that it is really a discipleship issue. Well, another discipleship issue is this idea of how we handle our finances. Because as much as Jesus said on the subject of the things that we say, he said more on the subject of our financial lives. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables. Almost half of his parables had to do with our possessions and how we think about these things. One in 10 verses in the Gospels deal with finances and material possessions. The Bible as a whole devotes 500 verses to prayer, uh, less than 500 verses on faith, but over 2,000 verses deal with our money and our possessions. And so as a preacher and as a church, we want to preach the whole counsel of God. We don't want to just sidestep issues because they're uncomfortable, but we want to know what does God's word say about it? And make no mistake, this issue, these three things that we're going to be talking about, this elephant that we're confronting goes to the very heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus one time was asked, hey, what, is the, what is the greatest commandment of all the commandments? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. He also said in Matthew 6, 21, though, for where your treasure is, there were, there's where your heart will be also. There's this connection between our, our treasures and our hearts. And so this elephant is a heart issue elephant. It's a discipleship issue. It's a spiritual growth and maturity issue. Every bit as important according to the Bible as prayer or Bible reading or going to church or all these other things that we talk a lot about. So of course as a church, we're gonna talk about it because Jesus did. Now we're gonna be focusing and a verse from the Bible that's going to kind of be the theme verse for, for, the, for the next three weeks. And it's Proverbs 13, 7. Proverbs 13, 7 says, One person pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. And the absolute vast majority of people, especially, I'm going to pick on young people, probably my age or younger, because I'm, oh, come on, I mean, I'm, you know, got to put a cut off there. But probably to younger people, that we, we as a generation and those coming after me, we have lots of stuff, but mostly because it's financed. I'm going to be mentioning several sort of financial gurus, some of them Christians, some of them not. But one of them that I used to read her books a lot, Susie Orman, she's on CNBC, she has her own show. She's not a Christian, but yet her books are filled with biblical advice. And a while ago, she wrote a book called Young, Fabulous, and Broke, about how younger people have all this stuff they're fabulous. They live fabulous lives and have all this stuff, but they don't have any cash. They don't have any savings. They just have a lot of debt. One person said, however, living beyond our means in the present with debt from the past will financially cripple our future. A couple years ago, Atlantic Monthly Magazine had a cover story, The Secret Shame of the Middle Class. It goes on to say how in an emergency, over half of all Americans could not come up with $400 cash an emergency because of crushing debt. 
This is a huge elephant that is choking the majority of Americans. So today, we're going to look this aspect of the elephant right in the eye. And I'm going to challenge you today to, get, to do a couple of things, to get angry and to get weird. And I say get angry because sometimes we have to get angry before we decide that we want to do something about something. And we've got to get angry about debt because it's suffocating you. And, and we've got to determine to actually do something about it. On the flip side, I want to challenge you to get weird. To get weird. Some of you say, well, I'm, I've already got that covered, right? I, no, I'm talking about get weird because we want to make a decision to not live like everybody else lives. We don't want to be normal if the normal of society is that we can't come up with $400 cash in an emergency. We want to be weird. We want to live according to God's word and not the world. I like what Dave Ramsey says about money. He says, if you live and give like no one else now, you can live and give like no one else later. And it all begins with step one, eliminating the debt elephant. Better yet, let's not get into debt at all. But probably most people, most of us here today, we have debt. It's so easy today to get into. Just ask a guy named Walter Cavanaugh. Back in 1972, pharmacist Walter Cavanaugh and a friend, they bet a steak dinner to see who could accumulate the most credit cards over the course of a year. At the end of the year, listen, at the end of the year, Cavanaugh had won that free dinner by applying for and obtaining 143 different credit cards to beat his friends 138. They were, at that time, banks were giving out credit cards like candy. But for Walter Cavanaugh, he was so intrigued by this, it was only the beginning. For the next 30 years, Cavanaugh continued to accumulate as many cards as he could. And at one point, about 10 years ago, he held the Guinness World Record with, over, uh, with uh, nearly 1,500 credit cards, amounting to a credit line of $1.7 million. Now, it is illegal, thank goodness it's illegal this day and time, but back in the 60s and 70s, credit card companies used to mail out actual credit cards to anyone and everybody, even people who didn't want it, didn't ask for it, didn't apply for it. Some families... For example, in 1906, uh, five Chicago banks banded together. They mailed out five million cards to people. Again, people that hadn't even asked for them. Some families received up to 15 credit cards from the same bank. The dead people got credit cards. Babies got credit cards. Even a dog named Alice was sent one. (laughs) Actually, she was sent four cards, one of which arrived, listen, one of which arrived with the promise that that Alice would be welcomed as a preferred customer at many of Chicago's finest restaurants. I, you know, I was going to, like, I was going to list all the statistics about the level of debt in our society. And I, I'm not going to do that, first of all, because it's always changing and it's always rising, but we know. We know that the debt level carried by most Americans is staggering. And probably you're aware of that because you are dealing with that in your own life. A lot of people stuck with debt. And you know debt weighs on you. It's an actual burden that is carried around. Another financial expert, a Christian guy named Joe Sengel, points out in one of his books. He says, debt is the single greatest cause of stress and financial problems. He goes on to say, he says, I've never, I've never had one person come up to me and say, hey, Joe, I just got a credit card and I ran up the huge balance on it and I maxed it out and all my dreams are now coming true. He said, that has never, ever happened. And so as we think about this, 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 this elephant debt, here's sort of, here's the million dollar question. What lengths would you go to in order to eliminate your debt? Uh, I, I shared this a few years ago, but a recent sur- a survey back then showed that over 30% of us would sell an organ to get rid of debt. A third of us would do this. Also found out that, that, that 38% of us would take, listen, would, would take part in a questionable health study. Like if we could get paid enough to get out of our debt. Uh, that's ridiculous. They also found that 55% of us would be willing to turn our lives into a full-time reality show in exchange for our debt to be paid off. Now, the bottom line is that even though debt is so, so easy to accumulate, it is so hard to get out of. And eventually, desperation sets in. But what if I told you there is a plan, there is a way 
There is some wisdom to get out of debt. And you wouldn't need to give up a kidney. You wouldn't have to take some shady medication. You wouldn't have to become the next Kardashian sister or your kid the next honey boo boo. Like, like there is another way to do that. And it's all in the Bible. So we're going to look at that. In your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Now, I'm going to put a couple verses on the screen, but I really want everybody to turn to that in your Bible or on the Bible app on your phone. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can pull one from under the seat in front of you, the blue Bibles. It's going to be on page 516. But we're going to be looking at Proverbs 6, 1 through 11. It's Proverbs 6, 1 through 11. And... Um, and so, so read along with me. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, My son, Proverbs 6, 1 through 11. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, uh, that, that is if you, if you have incurred debt, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you have said and snared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, in verse 3, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Verse 4, allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, it has no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer, gathers its food at harvest. But how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. The greatest, the greatest advice anybody could ever give you about finances. And I drill this into people when I do premarital counseling because I did not get this advice. Lori and I, if we would have gotten this advice and lived by it, we would, we, our lives would be so much different today. But to kind of give you a sneak preview, the, the, the Bible's plan is very simple. You give the first 10% away, and then you save another 10%. And then the other 80%, you live on wisely. You live on wisely. 10% to God, 10% to yourself and savings, and then you live on the 80%. And if you do that from, a, from an early age, and if you work hard, I'm not saying you can just sit back, but if you work hard, but you follow that 10, 10, 80 plan, you likely will not have any financial issues in your life. I wish so badly that somebody would have told us that 30 some years ago. Because as Proverbs says, when, 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 when you are ensnared by debt, the bottom line is you need to act fast, you need to act decisively, and you need to act quickly. I love, I love what Dave Ramsey says about debt and about this passage. And, and go ahead and watch this little clip of, of how he describes this. Years ago, I discovered God is smarter than me. <laughs> and when he says, you're here and you don't want to be here, so do this, I'm listening for what comes after that. That's a big deal. If you're in debt, biblically, do this. Give no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. And deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, a bird from the hand of the fowler. And I promise you, it's not very reverent, but I promise you I went, great, gazelles. What am I going to do with gazelle? That night, God answered my prayer. I was scanning the channels, and I hit the Discovery Channel. And there on the Discovery Channel, there was the gazelles. They were out there gazelling around. And what were they doing? Well, I said, well, you know, here it is. There's the gazelles. And you know the gazelles were not there by themselves, right? You know somebody else was around, right? Looking for lunch in all the right places. And gazelles, they have a cheetah detector right behind their ear. When they see a cheetah, they go like, uh-oh, cheetah, run! <laughs> now, the Discovery Channel said that the, the cheetah is the fastest animal on dry land. We had to slow this down so I'd have time to talk. He goes from zero to 47 miles an hour in four leaps. Now, it's starting to come clear to me. Here's how you get out of debt. You deliver yourself like the gazelle from the hand of the hunter. The primary predator of the gazelle is the cheetah. Here's how you get out of debt. You run! You got to bust it! You got to look. He picked out the college student, didn't he? Hey, hey, you want a free hat? Hey, I'll give you a t-shirt. Just sign up for this credit card. You want a pizza? Hey, come here, kid. You need to build up your FICO score. Come here, kid. 
That was how you get out of debt. You got to run, baby. You got to put it in gear. You got to go, 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 go. Did you get what he was trying to say? Like, was that, was that clear in that? So look at, look at verse 3 again in that passage. So do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, it says, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. And that word exhaustion in the Hebrew, it literally means throw yourself down. Throw yourself down. It's a powerful image. It's, it's, it's the image of throwing yourself down on the ground meant to convey exhaustion. But listen, also, it has this idea of a sense of humility. Humility. The message paraphrases it this way. Dear friend, if you've gone into hock, don't waste a minute. Get yourself out of that mess. And so the bottom line to this passage is you need to get busy. You need to be doing something. Look at the intensity of these verses again. How long are you going to lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief. So during this series, I'm going to ask you to commit to a number of things that are going to help you win in the financial area to attack this elephant. And as I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to say, let's get angry and let's get weird about this because it is ruining lives. And we need to commit to attack and to pay off consumer debt. Now, if you are uh, visiting with us, maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're just checking things out, or maybe you came for Thanksgiving dinner, we are glad that you're here. And chances are, perhaps you have a similar elephant in your house. And I want to encourage you to keep coming because... Because maybe some of these things that you'll hear, you'll hear for the very first time. But I want you to keep in mind this. If you're visiting, if you're checking us out, that next week we're going to be talking specifically about giving and about tithing. And in that message, I'm going to be talking specifically to Christians. And if you're not a Christian, if you're just checking out the church, I'm not necessarily talking to you next week. Although I want you to listen because it, it, it has truth. And next week, I'm going to share with you uh, what, what I think are kind of, I'm calling them five stages in the life of a giver. And I think it will help you understand how this process goes. But tithing is a biblical essential part of how we are to manage our money so that we can put ourselves in a position to be blessed by God. And then in two weeks, we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about saving and about, about getting wealth. You see, God loves us so much. He gives us clear instruction in his word about this thing called money or possessions or whatever you want to label it that is so intrinsic to our lives. Like we need that stuff literally to live. And yet God wants us to know how to, how to deal with it, how to handle it. And most importantly, God wants us to learn to trust him with it. He knows that if, he knows that if we can learn to trust him with our money, We'll be able to trust him with every other thing and every other part of our life. Such a primary part of life. And so, of course, the Bible teaches about it. And so, of course, we preach about it. At our church, we don't avoid hard subjects, but we want to deal with what does God say about these things. Now, I have a lot of respect for, for older folks, like, like people my parents' age, but especially my grandparents' generation. Debt to that generation was literally a four-letter word to them. I mean, they avoided it like the plague. And if they had to incur, incur a small amount, they just, I mean, they busted their humps to get it paid off. They were just so much smarter with their money than most of us who came after them are. I remember my grandmother. My grandmother was a, was a widow fairly uh, early in life. My grandfather died fairly young and, and come to find out really did not leave a whole lot to her. And so she had to be smart. Her, their own kids were pretty much grown up, but she decided she was going to watch kids in her home to make money. And I just remember how careful and how frugal she was with her money. But one thing she would do was she would save her quarters and about every, about every couple of years, when, when, when our grandma was saving her quarters, she would make the announcement, hey, it's time to go to Bear Creek Farms. And Bear Creek Farms is this wonderful restaurant in Indiana. And she would take our whole extended family there. There's about, about 30 of us. This is a, a big family. And we would all enjoy that meal because my grandmother collected her quarters and saved them because, because it was just something that was very, very special for her to do. 
And so when I think of like, like how to handle money, I think of, I think of my grandmother. Like, I don't, I don't know who that would be for you, but I want you to get somebody in your mind that you, that you kind of look to and have a great deal of respect for somebody who, who just has, has done a good job with their money. And I want you to imagine sort of a three-person committee. And I, like I said, I have my grandmother in mind. So I, I imagine a little three-person committee of Jesus, Dave Ramsey, and my grandmother. All right? They, they get a little committee together, and they're going to help get out of debt and give some advice for how to avoid this elephant. And so here's the advice I think that they would give you, and I know that they would give me. And the first thing is just stop. <laughs> just stop going into debt. They would um, share a delicious recipe with you, uh, which involves turning up your oven to 350 degrees, taking all of your plastic credit cards, putting them on a cookie sheet, and then putting that into the oven and saying, the day for debt is over. I think the second thing they would say again is, is save save. Save $1,000 fast. They would tell me, I think, to pay the minimum on, on everything else until you could get $1,000 of cash stowed away for an emergency so that when these emergencies come, you don't have to go deeper into debt. Emergencies. Like, like I'm talking real emergencies. I'm not talking about the father who, who gave his college student daughter credit card and said, okay, Nani, this is, this is only for emergencies. Yeah, he, he said, you know, it's amazing. I, I don't know what happened, but it's amazing how many emergencies happened at Domino's and, and, and 21 Forever and the Avenue, like, right? Like real emergencies. Another thing that they would tell me, Dave Ramsey and my grandmother and Jesus, would, would be to tithe. Would be to tithe. I love that, that, that scripture that Rick shared earlier about the widow who, who, because she had so little, she gave more than all the other people. But they would say the key to getting out of debt is, is to give. And yet that is one of the first things that people tend to do when there are financial problems is they stop giving if they were ever giving in the first place. And Dave Ramsey, your grandmother, and Jesus would say that is a terrible idea. In fact, they would say one of the reasons probably you're having issues in this area is because God is not in control of your finances. And it's a known fact, and again, we're going to talk about this next week, that, that giving God the first part, giving God the first 10, will make the other 90% more than enough. Do not cut God out of your finances. You be faithful to him, and he will be faithful to you. And the bottom line is that if you are suffering in debt, then you need him involved in your finances more than ever. I think another thing that they would say and, and, and very, very practical is to use what's called the snowball effect. That is, you're paying debt. Start with the one with the smallest, uh, the smallest amount. And when you get that paid off, take that minimum payment and apply it to the next smallest amount. And so, so just kind of a snowball effect. I think another thing that they would say is, is create a monthly budget. And, and some of you are saying, what was that word he just said? But what? But, but, budget. I know my grandmother would tell you that you've got to plan on where your money will be spent. And that only happens with the budget. Ramsey, Dave Ramsey says you create a budget and decide in advance where your money is going to go. As John Maxwell says, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Now, there are a lot of ways that you, can, that you can create a budget and stick by a budget. There's the tried and true envelope system. You can create a massive Excel spreadsheet. Um, a couple years ago, I'd started keeping track of all our finances in Quicken. It's automated. It's, it's, it's connected to all of our bank accounts. It is absolutely the easiest, best thing around, in my opinion. But there are all kinds of apps and helps to help you do this. But to create a budget, live by it. Another thing they would say is to live as frugally as possible. Uh, live as frugally as possible. I think another thing they would say is, well, maybe, maybe you need to get a part-time job. You say, well, I've got a college degree. I'm not going to wait tables or flip burgers. But, but like Proverbs says, maybe you need to humble yourself and, and think, what could I do to earn some extra money? A few years ago, I was trying to figure out how I could earn a little uh, extra Christmas money for gifts for the family. And so I decided to sign, sort of scrounge around some writing assignments. And so I called the, uh, on a whim, I called the editor of a magazine that I had written for before. And I just called and said, hey, I'm just kind of wondering if you have any, anything that you need writing for. And, and literally she said, I am so glad you called. She said, I just had somebody cancel out on this article. I think you'd be great to do it. Would you do it? And I said, I'd love to do it. 
but I had her on the hook. So I said, well, do you have any other things that I can do? Maybe I'll do this if you have some other stuff I can do. And she said, yeah, sure, you can do some more stuff. So in like a 15-minute phone call, I had about $1,000 of work. I think God will help us with those situations if we just go to the point of exhaustion. And sometimes we need to pray for creativity. Sometimes we need to pray for wisdom and watch what happens. And uh, so I think there's a lot of things that this three-person committee of Jesus, Dave Ramsey, and my grandmother would tell me to get out of debt. Now, I want to tell you this right now. We want to help you with this situation. So, so to help you in all areas, we're going to do, I'm going to do a few things. And, and um, the first thing I just, I'm so excited to announce this. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but right here at our church, starting in January, we're going to offer the Dave Ramsey class called Financial Peace University or FPU. Now, there is nothing better to help you put all these pieces back in place to kick that elephant out of your house. Than this, than this class. And I know it's an elephant, right? We don't want to acknowledge it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. But I'm, I'm telling you, like, if, 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 you, if you need help, this is, this is the thing to do. Uh, the class is going to be led by, by Tim and Heidi Caswell. And I want you to watch just a little bit of their story of how they got mad and how they got weird and how they confronted this elephant in their living room. Watch their story. My name is Heidi Caswell, and this is my husband, Tim Caswell. And we have three kids, ages six and under, and we've been living in Owasso for about 10 years and attending First Church of Christ since 2011, when we were married. I've gone there and attended there almost my whole life. Uh, kind of veered away when I went to college, uh, but then came back when Heidi and I got married, and then even more so when we started having kids. We said many years ago that we wanted to raise our family a certain way. And that's really when I think we became fully committed to going to church regularly and showing our children the way that we love Jesus and so that they can love him the same. We are proud to attend First Church and our kids love coming here to the special events and Wacky Wednesday. Um, and on Sundays. And I think that it's important for us to stay committed. You know, even in this hard season of life, I think it's important for us to continue coming and to make it a priority. And we want our children to be excited about it and love Jesus just the way that we do. So I grew up Catholic and my family, we attended church regularly every Sunday. We went to um, church functions regularly. And it was just a, you know, a big part of my life. And I think that I actually did not attend a different type of church um, until I was in college. So when I had the opportunity to attend First Church of Christ with Tim when we started dating, it was just an instant love, I think, for the culture and just the community and um, really the laid back approach, you know, that you can come in just as who you are and feel welcome. As a Catholic, you know, you're baptized as a, I mean, typically as a baby. And I, I didn't think too much of it. You know, I just thought I've been baptized and I go to church and, you know, this is the way that life is. And our kids obviously will do things differently now that we're not necessarily raising them as Catholics. But the conversation that I had with Chris and he said, you know, I want you to think about what's important to you. And it really changed um, my view. And it was so important for me to make that decision to do it on my own when I was ready to do it. On a Sunday morning in 2016, and I was baptized and it was a fantastic day. So having three kids that are six years old uh, and younger, both working full-time jobs, and now having kids that are involved in sports year-round, it's uh, challenging to say the least. Uh, most importantly, and as Chris has mentioned in his past sermons, um, raising kids in today's age uh, to follow God is extremely tough. Um, so to lead our kids by example, that you can handle money correctly, 
give back graciously and to follow God is a top priority for us. In 2011, when we married, we had debt up to our eyeballs, um, mostly student loans. Tithing was not something that we were able to do. And so we decided that we needed to really sit down and get serious about making a change with our finances. Tithing was, you know, one of the most important things that we had to put our money aside for. Sure, yeah. We got to the point with our finances and our income where we thought we'd be a little bit more financially sound and have more leeway uh, financially, but uh, it seemed to be at the end of every month we were out of money. So we knew something had to change. Um, my dad back in college gave me a book called The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. And at the time, uh, I just kind of threw it on the bookshelf and said, you know, great gift, Dad, thanks. Uh, but, you know, I, I knew his teachings. I knew the general principles of what Dave Ramsey did. And uh, we started looking back into that uh, when we had this epiphany that we should probably look into our finances. And I really think that when the change came about with us personally was probably when we started talking about having a family. Um, we decided at that time that we wanted to make the change for our children, our future children. Yeah, absolutely. Changing the family tree. Right? So they will be uh, leading that class. Uh, next week you'll be able to, to sign up for it or they'll be here to ask more questions if you have it. I cannot recommend to you highly enough uh, taking that. So that is one, one thing that we want to do to help you. The other thing I want to share with you is that I'm going to be every Friday uh, putting something on my personal blog, some aspect of money management, some tips, some resources. And I'm going to start doing that this Friday going all through this year and all through next year. And so all you got to do is go to chrishiggins.org and you can sign up to get the post automatically emailed to you. Um, but there are so many things that I want to share with you that just there's not time enough in, in a couple sermons. And so I'm going to be putting a lot of content and a lot of uh, information on that, uh, chrishiggins.org. And uh, that I think will really, really help you. Plus, I'm going to be making some other resources available over the next couple weeks. Uh, and then thirdly, again, I just want to ask you to commit to coming here the next two weeks. We're going to be talking about what the Bible says about saving for the future. We're going to be talking about how to reduce stress and anxiety with money, how to, how to supercharge our financial plan, and how to use the money that God has given you, most importantly, to change lives. Not just your lives, but as we'll see next week, the lives of a lot of other people. By trusting God by giving to him first, and by being responsible biblical stewards with what he's given to us. So I hope that you will plan on being here the next couple weeks and then take advantage of these other uh, things that we're going to offer to help you.